Welcome to this PowerPoint presentation about organizational change. In many ways, what we're going to be talking about is something called organizational development. Organizational development is sort of the buzzword in business circles for planned organizational change. Sometimes organizations change due to forces beyond their control, but when the change is planned, it's called organizational development. There can be a lot of different reasons why an organization may have to change. Often, it's because of an economic shock of some sort. The economy has taken a nosedive. The pandemic that happened in 2020 and 2021 uh, created tremendous economic shock for all kinds of companies and many small businesses went out of business entirely. And often economic shock means that you have to downsize. You have to decrease your workforce, force, which means you have to fire some people. And this, uh, needless to say, can be quite stressful. But one of the reasons organizations have to change is because financially they will not be able to survive if they don't. Sometimes change is necessary because of changes in technology. Uh, businesses do not work the same way now that they did 50 years ago before we had uh, computers and the internet. Uh, the world is very, very different. And any business that refused to go along with the changes that were occurring in technology uh, is no longer with us. So technology is sometimes the driving force behind organizational change. Often change happens when there's a merger or an acquisition of some sort. One company buys out another company or two companies merge. This can be very stressful because you're taking two different companies who might have been competitors beforehand and you're putting them together and you might have two very different cultures clashing. And in order to overcome this conflict, the organization has to change in a way that will incorporate uh, people from both of the previous companies. <clears throat> and change occurs uh, because society changes, social trends change. Uh, it used to be that white males were in charge of everything and the whole system was set up to facilitate uh, their progress. And there were all sorts of uh, discriminatory policies in companies uh, that worked against women, that worked against minority groups. And uh, because society has changed and diversity is now a much more important thing for companies to worry about, uh, the company has to change to keep up. So there are a, a wide range of reasons why organizational change might occur. Something that's almost um, universal, though, is the fact that employees resist change. And it doesn't matter what kind of change it is, um, the employees usually are against it. Now, there are a lot of reasons why this can be the case. Um, sometimes people just have a certain way of working. They have a habit. And it's hard to break habits, as you know. And it's just easier to keep doing things the way you've always done them. And so there's going to be a resistance to anything that's forcing you to break out of your old patterns of behavior and do something different. And there's a fear of the unknown that goes along with that. What if I'm not gonna be able to do this? What if I'm not gonna be able to learn this? What if I'm not going to be competent doing it this new way because I already know how to do it the old way? So there's a lot of baggage there. And um, people feel insecure. What if after these changes, occur, they find out that they don't need you anymore. What if your job is no longer necessary? And so there's resistance to change because there's this fear that um, you might end up either losing your position, being demoted, or maybe you're going to have to take on more work than you had before. Whatever it might be, whatever the employee sees after change, it doesn't look good to them. So employees typically go through a series of stages in dealing with change. The first stage is denial. The employee is convinced that the old ways are still going to work and they create all kinds of reasons why the change won't work and so they just uh, pretend that this isn't happening. Stage two is defense. When it's clear that the change is happening, they will actively resist it. They will sabotage it. They will be 
passively aggressive against it. They will behave defensively uh, and avoid doing any of the things that they're being asked to do. Stage three is known as discarding. When the employee reaches this stage, they finally recognize that this change is going to happen with them or without them. So they've given up this idea that maybe this is going to go away and they decide that they don't really have any alternative other than to go along with the change. So in stage four, you get adaptation, where the employees try to learn the new system. They try to figure out how to make this work for them. And stage five is called internalization. Uh, this is the full buy-in. Finally, they've figured it all out. They're comfortable with the new culture. And after a while, they even may forget what it used to be like uh, before. So uh, stage one, two, three, four, and five are all things that employees pass through when uh, change is coming. I've been at Knox College long enough to remember uh, having a career there before we had computers on our desks and before there were such things as email and PowerPoint. And when these changes started to occur and people were told uh, things are only going to be sent on email, we're not going to be using paper anymore, uh, you have to learn how to use email, you have to incorporate technology into your teaching, a lot of my senior colleagues were resistant to this in all of the same ways that I've just described here. But these very same people, after some period of time passed, were perfectly comfortable and happy with the system and probably even forgot how much they had fought it when um, it originally came around. There are a number of different models that have been developed to uh, describe ways in which organizations can manage uh, change and get people to get past the resistance part. Uh, the earliest of these was probably the one developed by the famous social psychologist Kurt Levine in 1951. It's called the three-stage model of organizational change uh, because you go through three stages as an organization to try to move uh, from one way of doing things to another. The first stage is called the unfreezing stage. Uh, basically, you explain why change has to happen. Um, you make people feel uneasy by making them feel guilty or anxious if they don't want to change. And you make them feel safe that this is going to be okay. You reassure them that this is not going to cause big problems for them. And then the next stage is the uh, movement stage or the moving stage where you're kind of getting to the desired state from the previous state. You're giving people feedback that um, shows that the changes are taking place. You get people to shift their actual behavior. And then you get into the rephrasing stage. Once you've got things the way you want them, you kind of lock them in place, make them permanent, and it becomes the new way of doing things. So that's kind of a very general way of thinking about how organizations can change. There's a more detailed model of organizational change that's uh, sort of popular these days. It's called Cotter's Eight-Step Plan for Implementing Change. It was developed in 1995. Uh, in a way, this is loosely based on the earlier model by Levine that I just described. And it's des designed to avoid the mistakes that are most frequently made by people trying to make changes in organizations. So what are the eight steps in Cotter's plan? First of all, creating a sense of urgency. You've got to pe make people feel there's a need for action immediately. Um, you know that people are going to be afraid, you know they're going to be angry, but you've got to make them feel like there's no choice here. If we don't do this now, we're going to be toast. Next, you need to build a coalition of some sort, a powerful team that can get the ball rolling to make change happen. Uh, and you got to get just the right people for this. You've got to have energy and enthusiasm. You have to have people that are really committed to it, people that are true believers. Uh, if possible, you want to get people who are opinion leaders in the organization. Opinion leaders are those individuals that other employees trust, and they look to them for guidance and reassurance. And if the opinion leaders say, 
uh, that things should be done a certain way, you're going to get them on board a lot faster. So if you can get these people on your team, that's going to take you a long way toward getting the job done. You have to make sure you get the vision right. So if you're making change, you've got to let employees see clearly what the possible future is going to look like. There's not just some hazy sense that things are going to be different. You have to make it crystal clear, here's what it will be like, and you have to articulate a strategy for getting there. Stage four is about communicating through the, out the organization. Lots of times a change gets started, the ball gets rolling, and then nobody really knows what's going on, and there's a lot of confusion, and nobody seems to have the answers to questions that employees have. So keep it simple. Uh, address what people are feeling. You know that people are worried about this. You know that people are feeling insecure. You've got to be sympathetic to that. Keep them in the loop and get rid of unnecessary junk and noise in the messages. Uh, sometimes people get so overwhelmed with information that it's hard for them to figure out what's the important stuff that they need to pay attention to. In stage four, you're really lasering in on the message. Here's the information you need to keep track of the change that's happening. In stage five, make sure you empower other people to act on this vision. Encourage risk-taking. Uh, let people think outside of the box. Uh, remove any obstacles that might be there that would get in the way of somebody helping you make change. So give people some um, say in the process. This one is important. Stage six, create short-term wins. Make change happen in baby steps so that progress is visible. You can see little things getting done. And this is very encouraging. Aha, it's working. I can see that the change is happening. And it's also a way to win over skeptics who might be thinking that, ah, this is never gonna work. Well, when they see that it is working, even if it is in small steps, that kind of weakens their resistance. And stage seven, don't let up. Sometimes companies uh, start doing everything right at the beginning, and then when they have some early successes, they sort of take the foot off the gas, and the whole thing just sort of starts drifting. Um, pursue change to the end. Make sure you get all the way through before you let up. And finally, make the changes stick. Once you've gotten where you wanted to be, you've got to make it the core of your new culture. You have to do all of the things that we discussed in the PowerPoint presentation about organizational culture to make it become part of the air that the employees breathe. It makes it second nature to them. Now, one of the problems you run into when you're trying to make any kind of changes as an organization is that every organization has um, what have come to be called sacred cows. This is a certain way of doing things, practices that have been around too long, and it decreases productivity. And so for real change to happen, you have to identify these sacred cows and get rid of them, butcher them, if you will. To find out if a sacred cow is ready to be slaughtered, there are a number of questions that you can ask about some practice or policy that's in place. Why are we doing this? In other words, uh, we have this policy and we do things a certain way, and it's been this way for the last 40 years, but why are we doing it? What is the goal? What is the purpose of it? And if nobody can come up with a good explanation for why we're spending time doing things this way, that's a sign that this sacred cow uh, may be ready for the dog food factory. Another question, what if it didn't exist? What if we just got rid of this committee? What if we just eliminated this policy? What if we just threw away this extra step in the process? What would happen? And most of the time, because it's so much a part of the culture, people haven't thought about that possibility. And if you start to realize that, you know, if we got rid of this, nothing would change or things would actually be better, 
Again, that's a sign that the sacred cow that's ready to go. Another question, is it already being done by someone else? Maybe some policy or practice made sense 30 years ago, but since then, because of changes in technology or the way the company's organized, you now have somebody else doing essentially the same work and what you've got is a duplication of effort. And the sacred cow hunts are a way of trying to discover that. How and when did we start doing this? This is a question that is too rarely asked. Um, sometimes things were started for a specific reason. Um, I can think of committees here at Knox that were created to deal with a very specific situation. And once that situation was eradicated, for some reason or other, the committee kept up a life of its own and it started searching around for things to do. Well, if you ask the question, how and when did we start doing this? You may discover you don't need a committee anymore to be doing that. And can what we're doing now be done better by someone else? Maybe the company has been doing something in-house for a very long time. Maybe the human resources department has a very expensive and time consuming uh, management assessment program or a way to select people for management positions. But you only use it a couple of times a year and you've got all these full-time people getting paid. Uh, maybe by outsourcing this to a consulting firm, we could save money and have the job done better. But unless you ask the question about whether it could be done better by somebody else, you're never gonna get there. So once again, why are we doing it? What if it didn't exist? Is it already being done by someone else? How and when did we start doing this? And can it be done better by somebody else? There are certain kinds of things that usually become sacred cows. There's the paper cow, where there's a paper trail for every minute little thing that happens in the company with three copies being sent and filed in many different places. And it may simply be that this much paperwork is not necessary. There's the speed cow. A lot of companies put intense pressure on employees to get things done quickly by a deadline. But then it turns out after the work is done, it just sits there and nothing happens for a long time. The deadline was unnecessary. So this need to get things done quickly may be a sacred cow. There's the meeting cow. Um, Meetings are very addictive and companies get in the habit of having meetings all the time for all kinds of things. And most of the time at the meetings is kind of wasted with small talk or going off on tangents. And the time could much better be spent working on something else instead of having yet another meeting. And identifying when meetings are necessary or unnecessary is another way to uh, get rid of a sacred cow. And of course, there's the cash cow. Well, this is just my attempt at a lame joke. Forget about the, the cash cow. Now, how can you make these cow hunts successful? Well, first of all, there's got to be some incentive. So reward people for finding them. If somebody finds something that can be changed or gotten rid of, Maybe there's a prize for that, or money, or at least recognition of some sort. And when you have successful cow hunts, um, having some sort of company tradition, something that becomes part of the culture to celebrate that might work. Uh, some companies have something dumb like little cowbells. And when somebody finds a sacred cow to get rid of, they start ringing this cowbell and people can hear it uh, through the office and they say, aha, we found another sacred cow that we can get rid of. Uh, some companies have even done something funny like uh, have a monthly barbecue out in the parking lot where they cook some beef uh, and symbolically uh, roast a sacred cow that they've been able to get rid of. And so organizational development in companies is a big deal. And the speed of change is increasing dramatically in the 21st century. Technology, society changes, um, 
the economy. I mean, there's just so many things that make companies constantly have to be on their toes and ready to change. So organizational development is very, uh, actually a very good field to go into right now. If you can become a change agent, somebody who's good at helping organizations move from point A to point B, uh, you're going to be able to stay employed. And there are a lot of different techniques that are used uh, in organizational development. Uh, sensitivity training uh, is something that's done where people um, are involved in focus groups and discussion sections that um, help them explore new ways of thinking about things, um, doing surveys, getting feedback from surveys. Uh, for those of you that are psychology majors who want to go into business, uh, having skill with statistics and survey fee uh, stuff is uh, going to be very employable. Outside consultants, bringing them in to help you with change. Sometimes it's hard for people inside the organization to be objective about changes. They have too much invested in it and they can't see the problem because they have blinders on. Bringing in somebody from the outside often gives you a fresh perspective and helps move change along. Team building can be important. Increasing trust and openness um, with intense interactions between people, uh, breaking down barriers between managers and employees. Uh, this is a way of helping with organizational change. We talked about team building in a previous presentation. Reducing conflict between groups and diffusing stereotypes, getting people to be on the same team rather than seeing people in other departments as competitors is essential. And there's something called appreciative inquiry, identifying the special strengths and qualities that employees have, uh, making them feel good about themselves, but also discovering ways in which they can contribute uh, to the change that's occurring. But dealing with st uh, the stress that comes from organizational change is important. Uh, organizational change is one of the main sources of stress in work organizations, and it takes its toll on employees and on the company's bottom line as well. I don't talk about stress very much in this class. If you're interested in the issue of workplace stress and how to deal with it and what its effects on employees are, I recommend that you take the industrial psychology class that I teach, where stress is one of the main topics that we cover.